for God guides, he provides <laughs> in so many ways. It's so good to be with you, and I appreciate you coming out to be in the service with someone that you don't know. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I had the opportunity of meeting the Turners uh, back a few months ago, and we never met them before, but you know, it's not hard to get acquainted with God's family. And so I'm looking forward to getting to know you all, and so glad my wife was able to come and uh, be able to uh, share her with you all for a few days, and just trusting God will help us to uh, be a blessing to one another, that he can just uh, help, help in, in the ways that he sees fit. And then with uh, your live streaming, I think I may even have some friends back in, in uh, Talladega, a uh, good friend of mine that's recently been saved. I'll count him a, a son in the faith and uh, be so glad that uh, Adam is able to join us by way of uh, the internet this evening. But God wants to do special things for us. Not uh, that it has to be something that's, that's uh, bizarre and, and strange, but something that still has his, his touch on it in a sense that, that God's, God's able to work. Amen. I've been in ministry for 20 years where we're at. God's helped us. Um, I just know that he's still interested in people and in their needs and would just like to encourage you to uh, look to him uh, through these, these services and our time together. I'd like to invite you to, to turn for our scripture to Second Chronicles. That's in the Old Testament. Corinthians is in the New Testament. So Second Chronicles chapter number 15. You would have liked to have known me when I was a little younger. My wife gave me the, the nickname, the Faster Pastor. Uh, <laughs> I used to not speak as long as, as I do, but I'm still not, if you're acquainted with Bible Methodists, I still don't measure up to, to what they would uh, uh, often be classified as. I'd like to just give it to you right where we live and, and try to be as, as plain as, as we can and um, just trust that... Uh, uh, the Lord will, will direct us in, in our time. I'd like to speak on this, this first evening on the, the possibility of experiencing personal revival. To give, give us a foundation and a promise of the possibility that we can experience personal revival. We trust that the Lord might lift this church or your church if you're attending from somewhere else. But you know, it doesn't happen just all at once. It's individuals that God revives and he, he makes a difference. And so I'd like to read from 2 Chronicles chapter 15. We'll read the first four verses and then uh, jump down to verses 12 through 15 to kind of give us a summary. If you would like to follow along, we'll be drawing thoughts from the, the uh, rest of that chapter as well. As we read together, I'd like to invite you to stand as we read from 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse number 1. And the Spirit of God came to Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. And when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel, and sought him, he was found of them. And then going to verse 12, the response of the people. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart, and with all their soul, that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpets, and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and sought him with their whole desire, and he was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest, round about. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, as we look to you tonight, we are grateful for your word, 
for the guidance, the direction, and the help that it gives us. We thank you for the people that are here. Lord, those that have desired to be in your house after a long day, after stress, after demands, and Lord, may be tired in their body, but may you refresh their spirit. Touch souls, we ask, this evening. And as you help us, we do pray that we might draw closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A.W. Tozer made the declaration from his observations, I, I'm sure, nothing can prevent the spiritual rejuvenation of a soul that insists upon having it. Can, can we take that as, as uh, sound with scripture, with what we've read? That nothing can prevent the spiritual rejuvenation, a personal revival for the soul that insists upon having it. I find that a very encouraging idea. That, that declaration that, that nothing, wherever you find yourself this evening, thinking about how things used to be or what you've known before, the state that you find yourself in, battle that you have been going through, maybe it relates to others. That nothing can, can prevent you having a personal revival. Whatever they've been doing. Disappointed you or hurt you or somewhere in between. That there's someone in the way. But nothing can hinder us. We can have a fresh renewal in our soul. That, that, that's, that's good news. But you know, it's also challenging. Because if we really believe that idea then that means that it is available for anyone who insists on having it. Are we really interested? It involves determination. It requires more than good intentions. Yes, we must be earnest. But I'm so thankful for that great possibility that if we can underline it this evening, it's the fact that we can experience personal revival if it is our desire. Right. If we're determined, we can be spiritually rejuvenated. Our heart can be refreshed if that's what we're longing for. When we consider the uh, scripture and the setting for where we're drawing the thoughts from uh, this evening, just the previous chapter, Israel has had a great military victory. They have conquered their enemies. Well, at least the enemies that were on the outside, but God says there's more than just a military victory. You need to have a spiritual victory. <laughs> you need to have something that, that makes a difference on the inside. And so the Lord sent a prophet that brought a message that we have, have looked at and, and are going to be considering this evening. He brought a message to the king, to an individual. Now he also shared it with the nation, but I don't want us to somehow uh, miss, the, miss the idea that it's an individual promise before it becomes a national promise. It's an individual promise before it becomes a church reality. That each of us must know what God has for us, that we're in line with his word, that we're up to date in our, in our walk with him. And as the prophet spoke, he gave this, this simple principle that those who seek him will find him. The, the, the declaration that, that um, James repeats it in chapter 4 and verse 8 of his book, draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. It's one of God's, God's foundational guidelines, one of the truths that, that he, he impresses upon us. You're wondering, is it possible? Absolutely. Because he says, you can be sure that if you're seeking me, you're going to find me. If you're drawing nigh unto me, I'm going to respond. But then there's also the warning that if we should forsake him, he will forsake us. So it puts us in the balance that, that we're going to either draw closer to God during these, these meetings, we're going to seek him and find him, or if we fail to, if we forsake him, if we back up, the space grows wider between us. 
And so we're really not left with the option of saying, I think I'll just not decide. <laughs> we're either going to go forward or we'll find ourselves drifting backwards. We're kind of like someone that's sitting on the train track and the train's coming and we say, are we going to move forward or not? You say, I don't, I'm not going to decide. <laughs> if you don't decide, it already has been decided for you. Yeah. We're going to move forward or else we'll find ourselves going back. Yeah. You know, there's God's part and there's our part in, in a personal revival. Yes, and I'd like to emphasize that it all begins with God. Right. When I was initially considering that text, it, it says, if you seek him, he'll be found. And and James, he says, draw nigh, and he'll draw nigh to you. It sounds like it begins with us, but no. No, it, it, it started with the prophet who brought the message. It always begins with God. There's God's part and there's our part. God stirs our heart, and then we must respond. God gives promises, and then we must pursue them. We seek, and he responds. We have a longing and he satisfies it. That's it. That's it. We think that sometimes it started with us. We decided to start seeking God. We, we, we wanted to, to, to be a, a better person or we wanted something to happen. But you know where that longing comes from? It's that grace of God that goes ahead. That prevenient grace. That fact that he's working. And I want to just emphasize that as we're talking about that great possibility of a personal revival, I'm not, I'm not beginning at the place that you've got to try harder and, and you've got to work and, and, and that, that it's all up to you. No, it starts first of all, has God been speaking to you? Has, has He been doing His, His work, the Holy Spirit that draws us? God in His own way that reminds us of the possibilities of what we've known? Something that, that, that just... Just we find a, a longing. We recognize that there's, there's something that is not as it ought to be. Amen. That's God doing His part. You know, it falls into sort of two sides. And the first is we can't do God's part and He won't do our part. <laughs> it starts with Him. But then He has the responsibility laid upon us as to our response. When we believe that God is interested in our spiritual advancement, that He invites us to seek Him, that He promises to respond, that it's God's will to renew our heart, then we can expect a personal revival, personal renewal, if that's our desire. But we must take responsibility for the condition of our soul. And that's what the large part of the scripture here is emphasizing. God's part is that he dealt, that he sent the messenger. I like to spend the rest of our time with the fact that if we seek him, he will be found. Good. How assuring it is to know that regardless of what the preacher's like or who comes or who doesn't come or whatever else is happening. He says that if you seek Him, He will be found. You know, seeking involves a desire. I can drive a little ways from my house towards Pell City and pull in a parking lot and sit there and read. Oh, I've read books on my Kindle and done all sorts of things. Meanwhile, my wife jumps out and she's inside. She's in the thrift store looking for those bargains. <laughs> she has a desire, and she's seeking for them. Up and down the rows, under, behind. I could walk through there and never find it, but we bring home bags of good deals <laughs> and things we need, things that, that add to the, the, the decoration in the house. And How can we afford all the things we have? It's because I have such a good shopper for a wife. She is interested in those, those, those good deals Seeking involves a desire. The reason that we don't find them, I don't find them, is I really don't have a desire to comb through all of those things and I wouldn't know what I'm looking for if it happened to jump up and, and, and to holler at me. It's just not there. And in the same sense that if we seek Him, it involves a desire. The more that we want something, the more that it means to us, the longer you'll search for it. You say, I, I lost my pencil. Well, I don't see it under the floor, whatever, I'll go get another one. <laughs> it didn't mean that much to us. We don't care. 
I misplaced my keys. Well, let's tear the house apart. I, I need them. I'm going to look today. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to think about it. I'll wake up and remember another place. And what about that code? And were they outside? They mean something. And we're, we are seeking with a desire because we want them. And you'll search longer for something when you really want it. We must long for God's best. For if you are spiritually content, you will not be seeking. There are people that are satisfied with forms. I put money in the offering. I sang the song. I did what I was supposed to. I was in church. There are folks that are satisfied with memories. I remember when I prayed at the camp meeting. I remember when God touched me here and God answered a prayer there. All the things He used to do. Satisfied with substitutes of, of whatever nature. And if we're satisfied with our spiritual level, we can remain there. That will, be, that will just be where we are. I'm sorry to say that there's some folks who have a new experience that may not be on our list. We talk about salvation and sanctification and glorification, but they found petrification. Just petrified. Just kind of plugged right in and that's where they were, that's where they are, that's where they'll be. Got some petrified wood on our bookshelf at, at, at home. And it just is as hard and as solid it's not rotting, it's not growing, it's not doing anything. And we'll be that way spiritually unless we have a desire. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they're going to be the ones that are filled. One way to help us that we have the spiritual desire that we need is for God to examine our souls to help us. That we would consider where we are and where God wants us to be. How vital it is that we not measure ourselves against someone else or some other measuring stick. But where does God want us to be? How important that is. I find an example in, in church history of a Puritan preacher back in the 1600s named Thomas Shepard. He was uh, a, a large influence on Jonathan Edwards and the Great Awakening of America. This Puritan preacher preached a series of sermons on the ten virgins. Now, we think of a series of sermons, you know, five, ten ser sermons long. I understand that he preached from Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. From June of 1636 to May of 1640. <laughs> That's four years! I don't know how you keep a crowd's attention. He's a lot better than I am. But they said that, the, that his focus for the first half of that time was the need for the church to prepare to meet Christ. For those that were not ready in that parable, that they would examine their hearts, of course examine the, their container of oil to give thought to, to what they need. They could have known how much oil they had. They could have had as much as they wanted. What does God have available for us? That's good. If we know that He's promised to meet a need, we can know that He promises to meet it. How might He want to bless us and help us? I'd like to just fan that spark of possibility in your heart this evening. That you might just consider a, a what God can do and the, and the, the, the promises that, that He is interested in doing a work for you. Not to make you like someone else. Not to somehow put you in someone else's pattern. But that you would know that you would experience the, the work He has for your heart. There must be a desire before there can be an advancement. He says, seek Him. And with that, we first of all seek Him with a desire, but seeking also involves that we be diligent. It involves diligence. 
Well, we must respond to God's offer with an earnest heart. It's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 that reminds us that he that comes to God must believe that he is. And we say, amen, I believe that he is. And then it says, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. <laughs> you believe God is? Oh, yes, I believe he answers prayer. Oh, yes. You believe he's a rewarder? Yes, I believe he rewards those that, that diligently. There is something of, of an earnestness, a diligence that is there. That means to be seriously committed and prepared for whatever it takes. The scripture says in a number of places there of them that they sought him with their whole heart. How that they were seeking him with all their soul, as it says in verse number 12. To diligently seek is to be seriously committed and prepared for whatever it takes. Back in 1845, the British, still exploring in the area of Canada, decided to send a couple ships to look for that, that passage that they hoped was there, the Northwest Passage, to find a way across the, the northern part of Canada, which we know how the land lies and read our maps now, but. They were still, still doing some, some exploration at that time and, and hoping to, to make a discovery. And so two ships of unprepared soldiers were sent out. The captain, John Franklin, was the head of the, the, uh, uh, the, the adventure, the, uh, the, the effort that they, that they had, and he was responsible, no doubt, for preparing the, the ships as they should. They thought it would probably last two or three years, but they only carried a 12-day supply of coal for the auxiliary steam engines. Oh, but though they may not have had much fuel, oh, what luxuries they carried. There was a library on each ship of 1,200 volumes. Got, got to have something to do on those long days when you're, you're sailing across the ocean and looking for this. They had a hand organ. China place settings. There was cut glass wine goblets and sterling silver flatware. It seemed that, that they had cut, cut no corners. The sailors were dressed in, in their finest uniforms, but you know there was no provision for the cold. There was no special clothes for going up into the far north. There was no plans for how they would face the weather, the cold. And on that trip, every one of the 138 sailors on there froze to death. They all died. For over the years that would, would come, they, it would be discovered how the, the ships were, were frozen in, in ice and, and how the, some had, had left and some of the, the uh, Eskimos in that area reported seeing some of them trying to cross the ice, trying to, trying to find their way to help somewhere. The captain died on his boat. But they did find with him some of the backgammon pieces that he had. Now, that, you know, that's pretty important when you're, you're taking a trip up north, have a nice set of backgammon. It didn't matter a bit. Playing around with, with hand organs and fancy libraries and whatever else. What about the need for some good clothes, some heavy coats, some provisions? And so for miles around where the, the ships were found, they would continue to find remains for the next years. They would be wearing their nice dress uniforms, but they would not be prepared for the challenge of diligently seeking that passage in that very extreme weather. How sad it is that the casual traveler on that trip never had a chance. A good fancy boat with uniforms and good entertainment simply was not enough. And because we have a Bible and a hymnal and church clothes, it isn't enough for us to discover the new lines of grace along God's coastline. That simply is not the provisions that are necessary. For being one who diligently seeks is one who is serious to do all that is necessary. 
Tozier said the soul that insists on spiritual rejuvenation would have it. Right. Insists. Yes, sir. When the prophet spoke to the king here, he told him that you're going to need to seek. You're going to need to seek him with all your heart. It's interesting how that he responded. For example, in verse number 8, when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. It takes diligence. The king said, we're going to do something. We're going to remove the idols. We're going to get rid of some things. Have you ever sorted out your closets? Have you ever sorted out your basement and your garage and your attic? Have you ever decided that there was a time that, you know, we've just been to the thrift store too many times. We need to let some of that go. <laughs> we, we've got too many unused Christmas presents. We've got too many other things that, that we don't have the, uh, space for. And we begin sorting it out and we say, you know, this is important, but, but this isn't. This is, this is worth our time, but this, this isn't. This, this we can give space to, but we're not going to with this. Some things we have to maintain. We, we, don't, we don't need to keep putting, putting time and energy in, in, in this. It, it keeps breaking. It's no good. And we begin to remove what is not to be used. We had a wonderful yard sale a few weeks ago because we did some sorting. <laughs> Went through all of those places. Got rid of some of this. The king here says, we're going to do some spiritual sorting. We're going to remove the idols. We're going to get rid of these things that don't deserve our time, that shouldn't have space in our life. These things that are somehow crowding out God. And we remove these items that are not what God wants us to to be spending our time, our money, and our energy on. Oh, I'm not talking that it has to so much be something that we can, can name as an item, but, you know, attitudes like jealousy or envy. You know, things that, that come into our heart, into our life, that, that uh, we begin to give our attention to. Idols that we really haven't, haven't given consideration to, but it says that he, he went and, and he took courage and he put them away. It may not be obvious to you, but I would like to encourage you to do some sorting in your life. Good. Good. Evaluate what's really important. What really has first place? Removing the idols. Then they repaired the altars. You notice also there in verse number 8. Renewed the altar of the Lord. <laughs> well, of course, if we're going to be diligent in seeking Him, we've got to have our altar in place. That's how you do business with God. Right. If we're going to make progress, it's not going to be because we can talk better, it's not going to be because we can look better, but because we can pray better. And that will touch all the rest of what we are. Right. Nothing like an earnest prayer to make a difference right. as we're diligently seeking God. Yes, He sought Him with His whole heart, as they put it there in verse 15, His whole desire. And then He began to reject some hindrances. Farther on down into verse 16, it says that he got rid of the mother queen because she had made an idol in the grove. Rejected these hindrances. <laughs> Said, we can't be having revival and seeking God with our whole heart when we've got her right there trying to promote all of these things that are counter to what says is right.
says that after they sought him with their whole heart, he was found of them. He was found. The promise was given when we started. When we come down to the, to the conclusion, it was true. God's word was what it said. He didn't simply just put out a hope and a promise and, and, we, and we make a swipe at it and say, oh, it just wasn't so this time. But those that seek God and desire Him, those who seek God with diligence have the assurance that they'll find Him, the promise that He will be there. If your heart is hungry and your soul is not quite satisfied, I want you to know that you can have a personal revival. It, it doesn't have to involve special speakers or scheduled services. Those are wonderful aids. But rather it's the result of earnestly seeking Him. It's saying that I'm not going to accept a, a level of mediocrity, a mediocrity in, as my spiritual level. That, I'm, I'm not going to, to say that's just how it is. But rather I'm going to draw near to God and know of his refreshing touch. I found a, a short prayer that Jonathan Edwards supposedly prayed, no doubt had it written in his, his uh, personal writings. He said, resolved that all men would live for the glory of God. Resolved, second, that if nobody else does, I will. Amen. <laughs> That's the whole prayer. <laughs> you know, I trust that we all live for the glory of God, but we can still say I'm going to be responsible for myself and I'm resolved that if no one else does, I will. I want you to know that God has a special invitation for you. Seek Him and He will be found of you. Seek Him. And as He is found, I believe that there, there's, there's at least... Three, three aspects that just, just come to mind here. That when he's found, there's a renewal of his presence. A renewed sense. When God is found, there's a renewed sense of the power that he has for the walk that you need, for the provisions that where God guides, he provides. Yes, he's found with a renewed presence and a renewed power and then he gives us a renewed peace. As it mentioned there at the end of verse 15, the Lord gave them rest round about. Gave them rest within. Do you know the peace that God has promised? The assurance and the sense that has it been troubled, disturbed. When you're searching and seeking for him, he renews that peace. That's why I call that a great possibility. The offer that God has given to us that we might have personal revival. I'd like to ask you this evening, will you join me in seeking for him with your whole heart? That we might share together in making this few days that we have, one where the Lord can do the work that he desires, accomplish something that will matter. Help us as we continue to live for him. That's my longing, and I believe that it is yours, too, to be present on a Tuesday evening on the beginning of revival. That's what we're going to anticipate. That's what we're going to plan on. We're going to, to pull together that God will do that, we trust, in our, in our midst this week. As we close tonight, I'd like to invite you to stand with us. Let us bow our heads Close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the help that your word gives us when we find ourselves in need. Lord, our hearts are hungry. We find that our burdens are often heavy, but you're the one who is sufficient for every challenge. And Lord, the one who wants to do more than just help us to get by, but you want us, Lord, to find you and find, Lord, the help that we need. We're just asking that your presence would rest upon each one. May they know of your love, Lord, your interest, your desire to help each one where they are. Thank you for your mercies this evening, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.